it is your buddy peace and harmony with you here today and we're zooming in and focusing in on a very common question that I get in and that is really sort of the hyper attention uh, the undue attention the hyper vigilance and the control with which a narcissist or a psychopath has over them and how to get out of the reach of their control and before we get started um I want to give a huge shout out to all the viewers. Uh, great job. All the great work that you're doing. Working to put the pieces together, to connect the dots, to pick up the pieces and move forward. And great, you know, create a sense of, of semblance and strength and empowerment in your life. It really is about those results that we strive for here in the Peace and Harmony channel. So kudos to you um, for all your hard work and more power to you in the next um, coming weeks as we enter into a new year, 2018, which is just within earshot here in a little over a month or so. And I also want to give a huge shout out to uh, the viewers who have been making uh, comments and that I've been uh, assisting them. Particularly, uh, we received a question um, from a viewer who is inquiring about the glasses that I have. And these are actually by Mac Studio. Um, the brand of glasses is by Mac Studio. So M-A-X Studio, you can go to their website, macstudio.com, and I believe you can find these glasses. So thank you so much for your compliments. Um, and I want to give a, um, really furthermore, zoom in and focus in on the, the topic for today is, you know, the, the control the narcissist or a psychopath has over you. Essentially, when they control you better than you control yourself. Essentially, little by little, uh, you know, moment by moment, grain by grain, stride by stride, the narcissist or the psychopath is able to get control over others, controlling their feelings, their emotions, the things that they say, their decisions, um, how they spend their time, how they dress, how they spend their money, even the very professions that they take on. And it is because there is an unconscious setting up or dynamic or interaction within the relationship that the narcissist will engender or create a very sort of self-promotion um, sort of uh, uh, ethos or energy within the relationship, <clears throat> which is that, that there is nobody more important than them, that they are the most important one. They are the one with the humor. They are the one with the charisma. They are the one with uh, the talent. They are the one with the money. They are the one with the right opinion. And oftentimes it is very exclusive um, of others, which means they tend to um, exist or have a relationship with a tone or a feeling or an ethos or an emotion or energy which is basically that they know what is best, that they, it is very one directional and they are, you know, they are right. And they begin to, you know, create this unflinching allegiance um, to them and their opinion, their talent, um, their country, whatever it is that they are about, their ethnicity, um, they are very exclusive of others. So if you look at the narcissist, and what they have uh, required of you to be in the relationship, oftentimes it is what I call an unflinching allegiance. Um, it is an unwavering allegiance to them that you are agreeing to subconsciously in the relationship. In other words, you are not encouraged to think for yourself. You are not encouraged to feel for yourself. You're not encouraged to behave for yourself and be free, liberated, um, live your passion, live in uh, uh, attenuation or alignment or awareness of your life purpose, your life passion, what makes you, you, because you're not really embraced for being you. You're embraced for loving them. You're embraced for supporting them. You're embraced for what you can give them. Uh, gifts, money, attention, um, you know, the head nod that yes, you're always right. Um, they expect this unflinching allegiance in all those around them. And this is communicated in many a sundry ways. So whether it's, you know, you're their best friend, their lover, their spouse, you know, you had inadvertently made this compact or contract to 
be this unflinching allegiance to them. <clears throat> but oftentimes it means, you know, you're cutting off of your own life source. In other words, it's cutting off of your own life purpose. It's it's making a ultimate sacrifice, which is the sacrifice of your needs to be attended to, heard, listened to, embraced, valued for the person that you are. And oftentimes the tolerance that people then experience for being, um, for, you know, being very altruistic or self-sacrificing in the relationship is oftentimes very encouraged and applauded. But yet, you know, being um, highly altruistic, yes, it is a good quality to give of yourself, <clears throat> but yet you need to be able to receive. You need to be able to ask for what you need and not feel guilty, ashamed, um, you know, out of line, uncomfortable for being complimented, for being loved, for being attended to. For being, you know, it's just, it's like the child, you know, when you're, when you first have a child, they need to know that they are the center of the universe, that they are going to be taken care of, that their voice is going to be heard, that their feelings are worked through. It's oftentimes this very kind of stage, which is overlooked in a narcissist relationship. It's where you are not attended to, you are not validated, you are not valued, you are only valued for that which you can give to them. And so, you know, we uh, people oftentimes talk about, you know, on the channel, the givers and the takers. Um, the narcissists are indeed like the takers in the relationship. And then it might be a perfect match because you might happen to be a great giver. I give your time, attention, knowledge, food, money, uh, um, uh, rides, a place to live. You know, uh, you're always promoting them, supporting of them. Um and yet this begins, you know, this altruistic way of life, it might be good, but it might not be good when it burns you out, when it basically crumbles you down to the point of exhaustion or you feel empty or you feel like you are nobody without them. And so one's identity then, you know, um, gets caught up in terms of feeling, you know, like I can't exist without them. I don't exist in my own right. I don't exist in my own purpose. Um, for who I am. I'm not embraced for who I am and I, I'm not self-sufficient in that manner. I don't have that autonomy. I don't have that, um, that, you know, basically that identity, which is basically, you know, it's, it's your identity that has been based on your choices. It's been based on your decisions. It's been based on your mood, which, you know, your moods, which, you know, maybe, you know, you felt like you had to give in or you had to sacrifice or you had to, had to, had to, you know, you didn't feel like you had um, uh, an ability to make choices in your own best interest. You had to be self-sacrificial or altruistic in order to keep the relationship going. And then maybe you had made an error of judgment that, you know, self-sacrifice was the way to go, or maybe you had to. You, you know, it required your survival. I mean, this might, person might have been who, you know, who you were raised by, where you had to sacrifice this to appease, you know, the family members, or you had to appease your spouse in the beginning, or you thought that's what love was, was nothing but, you know, was self-sacrifice, which is, you know, what I call basically the Mother Teresa syndrome, where you begin to feel, you know, that you're, um, your life is is that only in the giving. In other words, your role is that of the giver. And once you've given yourself away, you know, eventually you feel like you don't have any more to give. It's like the well has run dry. The reservoir has been overfished. You are depleted. You are exhausted. And then you're wondering why you're not getting um, that with which you need or you're not receiving the love. It's because you have never allowed yourself to to really receive and you know now the narcissist has controlled you better than you can control yourself so you know people oftentimes lose self-control they they enter into fits of depression uh, fits of anxiety uh, meltdowns breakdowns um, not feeling like they can uh, function social anxiety uh, not being able to be employed um, they are um, they have not been able to um, enter into the workforce, so they've not been able to, 
you know, uh, find gainful employment because they don't feel good enough for themselves. They don't know how to control themselves around people when this person is around. In other words, they're so trauma bonded. They're so attached. Maybe in the beginning they were, you know, overly attached or trauma bonded where they can't, you know, exist in their own independence. They don't have that autonomy, that independence because the relationship called for them to give that power up and to give control over to the narcissist. In other words, it was the subconscious decision or feeling that you are smarter than me. You make the decision. You are better than me. You determine how I live my life. You, you know, you know more, you are better than me. <clears throat> so you tell me how to feel, how to be, um, how to spend my time. And furthermore, I will just almost, you know, become an underling or under your wing or underneath you um, for this relationship. And then furthermore, those decisions over time that are pe perpetuated and carry out, basically, you know, you're making the unconscious pact or decision to have them make you know make decisions for you because they know better and that you don't know how, you know you furthermore then can't control yourself you don't know how who you are people you know uh, will tell me i don't know what i want um i don't know what my passion is i don't know what my life purpose is that that's a very clear indicator that you have then opted for this person um this narcissist to take control over you or you know, the unconscious um, agreement that they are better than you, they can, they know, you know, they know what's better for you than what you know yourself. And so it's now for you to take, you know, the driver's seat and give yourself, you know, I know myself best. Um, I have the answers. Um, deep within me, residing within me, is the intrinsic knowledge of knowing what I need, how I should spend my time, what my passion is, what my life purpose is, if I were to only attend to it and listen to it. So that's exactly what the, you know, the recovery journal is about. It's recovering. It's like excavating. It's dusting off that inner voice that has the answers for you, that does know what's best for you, that does know how to control yourself and guide you <clears throat> to that which is in your best interest, how to spend your time, what your talents are, what your proper employment is, how you should engage in relationships, and how you should interact with life that that um, that knows this <clears throat> and operates with a sense of knowingness, certainty, if you are to excavate it. And so um, it's really it really is sort of the excavation process. And so to enter into that that place, you really do need to enter into um, that that sort of zone, if you will, within yourself. Will you allow the inner voice to have a, a sanctum or like an atrium, um, an arena for which to speak? So it is that, that focus, that area, which we're tapping into now, but to furthermore excavate it in the privacy of this video or beyond, you really do need to get pen to paper in order to excavate that voice so you can see it, you can hear it, you can feel it, you can feel, feel it coming through you. Um, you're allowing that... Um, to come forth and if you really just put pen to paper and when i just basically you know a call you know um what is like the spontaneous uh you know free free flow of words um but it is you know it is a time for you to um just sort of exhale if you will um if you can just exhale on the page get into just some free form writing write whatever it is that comes to mind without with that with it unedited um free, you know, uh, just free and clear, free of the inner critic, free of the narcissist, free of their criticism and their judgment. If you're just to write whatever comes to mind, um, I like this blanket, I like this couch, I want to paint the color of this room, whatever it is, you know, I need to do this, I need to do that. If you can allow yourself to write, say, three full pages of what comes to mind, just free flow, I think you'll surprise yourself because you'll begin to see, hear, and experience that inner voice, which is then allowing, which is the place where that self-control begins to emerge, that that one who knows, who has a sense of certainty, who knows your life purpose, your life presence, 
and where your peace resides. It's something that you can come back to this exercise time and time again, you know, or even if you just begin to vocalize that during, you know, during your day and begin to become aware, aware of your self-talk where you can begin to tap into that inner voice and allow you to speak to yourself in, in the privacy with your own in a little inner, um, your own inner atrium or your own little sanctum, if you will, begin to um, allow yourself to write and allow yourself to give yourself the answers, the solutions for which you have been looking for. So you might say, well, I'm so tired. You know, and then your voice will say, give yourself a chance to take it an afternoon nap or, you know, stop doing so much. Stop exerting yourself. You don't have to push yourself so much. So allow your inner voice to provide you these solutions. And I think you'll have a very pleasant surprise at what your own intuition, your own inner voice is trying to get your attention. When you get it on the paper, you have it right there is an immediate gift. It is your buddy, Peace and Harmony, with you here today, and I hope that these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support.